All right, uh, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Andrew Lin. Andrew is a principal and co-founder of Buildus, an Anacostia-based architecture and development practice that operates throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Buildus makes healthy buildings that pay tribute to their context and gain integrity as they age. He founded Build Us with Jack Becker in 2013 to provide access to high quality architectural services in DC's most vulnerable neighborhoods. Andrew holds a BARC from Cornell University and an MA in the History of Science and Medicine from Yale University. Since 2018, he has taught at Virginia Tech, the University of Maryland, and the Catholic University of America. And before founding Build Us, he worked for OMA, Tigerman McCurry, Fantastic Norway in Architectonica. Now a visiting professor at, of practice at Virginia Tech's WAC, Andy splits his uh, time between designing, teaching, lecturing, and managing construction sites. So please welcome Andrew. Thank you. Can you hear me? Cool. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I love Virginia Tech and Blacksburg and the studio here. Um, uh, as Patrick said, I'm visiting from the WAC, um, the Washington Alexandria Architecture Center. Um, and since uh, we're up there uh, working with students who come from Blacksburg, I'm sure we think about you guys here more than you think about us. Um, so I wanted to speak today specifically to practicing architects and also to those of you who are considering attending uh, and studying at the WAC in the future. Um, so um, <clears throat> I want you to think about the, what you see in this form, these series of forms. This one as well. What do you see? How about in this form? What do you see? I see the spaces between stars. And that's where our practice works. We work in the space between the stars. Um, so we're going to talk today about symbolism and perception in American architectural iconography. And we're going to use some very uh, commonly known uh, recognizable uh, spaces and um, forms to explore these concepts. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll start with Jakob von Uchtskull's uh, idea, understanding of the Umwelt, uh, which is a sort of worldview. It's the perspective that different organisms have on their environment and the world, and it changes based on the organism. It can change within different species. The tick uh, detects hair and certain scents and blood and warmth, um, and that's about it. On the other end of a certain type of spectrum is an astronomer who uses instruments to um, see deep out into space. And in between are all of us and um, other types of animals and organisms. Uh, so Jan Holt, the founder um, of uh, the WAC, um, introduced me to a concept of DC that changed my perception of DC and of um, how urbanism can function. Uh, so he helped me to see the DC square as uh, a sort of profound, profoundly moving uh, settlement pattern that hasn't really been replicated before or since in human history. Um, I used to focus more on the sort of core of the city. I think most people know of DC for the L'Enfant Plan. Uh, but Jan helped me to look at the edges of the square and to think about the space between the planned core and the edges. Uh, that's where a lot of um, activity over time in Rome has taken place, even though the focus is really on city center um, and DC. It's the same. And the statement that that um, design move is making, that we're going to inscribe a 100 square mile urban area to be filled over time, um, was totally groundbreaking. Uh, just for some perspective, for some scalar perspective, London at the time 1800 was the largest urban area in the world at a little over a million inhabitants. Uh, and it occupied less than 10 square miles. So the idea that a city might eventually fill a 100 square mile square was pretty revolutionary. Um, 
it began as an order by Congress for a 10 by 10 mile um, or a 100 square mile uh, um, city uh, somewhere in the landscape uh, along the border of Virginia and Maryland. And it over time became a 10 by 10 square, um, which was initially thought to be um, rotated to include Bladensburg um, in the, to the northeast of DC, which was at the time a significant small um, town. Uh, but instead, the square was rotated to be a diamond and to encapsulate Alexandria, where the WAC is located. Um, so in some ways, DC is a conventional walled city, except that its walls are permeable. And this is really a fundamental symbol of it as the capital of democracy. So these permeable walls allow for freedom of movement and communication. Um, and you're not confined to passing through uh, gates and portals anymore. The wall is no longer defensive, it's symbolic. Uh, and so this form has sort of resonated uh, throughout history, uh, but in a, in a relatively quiet and unacknowledged way. Jefferson, who had a hand in all of these different um, early design pieces that we'll be talking about, imagined pieces and locations within DC to be a sort of origin point for the entire country, a zero, zero, zero point. Um, and it never really came to, that, that idea never really came to fruition. The perfection of the square was interrupted by our civil war and by the realities of war, which forced us to think more about the landscape and less about the, the sort of symbolic imprint on the landscape. And a bit before the Civil War, Virginia decided to take back its piece of DC uh, to retrocede that piece. And so we've been left since then with a sort of scarred and mutilated capital that hasn't been repaired, despite all of the sort of woke um, discussion these days. Uh, so we have this capital that um, a large portion of it is sort of um, a ghost of what used to be there, a phantom limb. Uh, so, of course, DC has expanded and it's this big urban agglomeration that uh, moves beyond its uh, square borders, but the squares still, or pieces of the square still inscribe uh, municipal order, which is the, the DC, uh, the, the District of Columbia. Um, and so this square, this, this profound square, um, Jan helped in, with a, through a very short conversation helped me to understand it. Uh, as a divine city. So um, this is my favorite graphic of all time in all of history. This is a Roman coin from the Augustan Empire. Um, it was when Augustus declared that Julius Caesar, Julius, was divine. So this was announcing the divination of Julius Caesar and announcing the ability of Roman empires to become gods. Um, and so Along those lines, this sort of divine city of DC um, is different than other cities. It's just fundamentally different. And more, more than being connected to other mid-Atlantic cities or American cities, it's really connected to cities of the past and um, to a sort of uh, an, an eternal past. Um, uh, Jack, my, Jack Becker, my architecture partner, and I went to Cornell. And so we were educated uh, sort of in this realm of um, single city urban manifestos. Uh, Colin Rowe uh, looking at Rome, Unger is looking at Berlin, Rem looking at Manhattan, all of these um, conceptualized by Europeans living in Ithaca at the time. Um, we've since sort of followed along the evolution of, of this uh, idea, um, primarily through the work of Dogma and Pierre Vittorio Relli. Um, and we've paid attention as much as possible to urban manifestos that relate to the other cities on the eastern seaboard, um, however prominent they may or may not be. This is a quote by Jeff Mena um, in Gen Jennifer Bonner's um, Atlanta Guide to the Dirty South. What I find so interesting is that you are doing this in Atlanta. I know because you're located there, but also the fact that Atlanta is not necessarily considered a first tier city like New York or Chicago or Washington, D.C. I could see a fictional guide to Chicago or Manhattan, but how interesting could it be to apply the same methodology to small towns, rural areas, or forgotten cities off the radar? Talk about a forgotten city off the radar. He mentions DC as a first tier city, and then the, sec the, the final sentence of the thought includes Chicago, Manhattan, and Atlanta, and totally excludes DC. 
And this is pretty indicative of the um, attitude that architects and urbanists have towards DC. They acknowledge it as a first tier significant world city, but then proceed to sort of ignore it. Um, we work from a neighborhood that faces uh, similar prejudices. Anacostia um, doesn't receive the type of attention and sort of city services that it deserves from contemporary politicians. And in the past, um, it's been totally overlooked or even worse, um, pasted over on the maps. Um, and so there are many sort of pieces of DC that um, go unnoticed. Uh, up at the WAC, we're looking at studying DC as a um, series of interconnected um, campuses that themselves are archipelagos. So these campuses uh, float in a matrix of residential development um, related to each other, but uh, sort of self-contained. And we are analyzing those as they relate to DC as a whole, thinking about DC as a body um, and making inter very precise um, interventions. In order to grapple with the topic of DC, we have to understand classicism and why there is a push for classicism today. Um, and to do that, we'll use some of these very common symbols. We've already talked a bit about the square. Now we'll talk about the Statue of Freedom on the top of the Capitol. Uh, so growing up, I always saw the Capitol. I saw the dome, big white dome, big building. Never really noticed the statue on top. And now that I have uh, learned about her, I only see the dome as a sort of pediment that raises the statue up into the sky into a position of prominence. Uh, so this was the original dome of the Capitol, copper. When the Capitol building was expanded, it was thought that the dome needed to also expand to balance the composition. Uh, and thus, the um, statue was designed to uh, cap this uh, big new dome. Um, the, the process of constructing the 19-foot statue was somewhat elaborate. Uh, and now she's up there and um, has this position of prominence that um, goes somewhat unnoticed. Rather than facing the Washington Monument, which she's about eye level to, uh, she actually looks away from the Washington Monument eastward towards Europe. And it betrays a certain bias that uh, our country had since its beginnings with European settlers coming over to America, um, a sort of understanding of the relationship between America and Europe, maybe even more so than the relationship between Europe East, uh, America East Coast and the rest of the continent. Um, we also know that many of our founders uh, had somewhat um, esoteric beliefs. And so the idea of facing the rising sun surely played a role in um, the Statue of Freedom facing east. The cast that the statue was made from is uh, stored safely down in the basement of the Capitol, interacting with visitors and um, protected from the elements while the statue itself is uh, exposed on the roof of the Capitol and not even able to see the activities that happen behind her on the National Mall. Uh, she's usually represented as the darkest object uh, in images of the Capitol. And when she's brought down to the ground, she's held captive. Um, she wasn't always intended to be uh, a, a goddess, um, the Statue of Freedom. She began life as a um, both an eagle and a rooster in different schemes. Uh, the idea was then shifted over to um, converting the goddess Libertas to the goddess Columbia. Um, and uh, here she is, uh, born as the goddess Columbia, but named freedom triumphant in war and peace, aka armed freedom. Um, and so we can see she starts out relatively peaceful, the shield is stored safely on the sword, and she's sort of at rest. The next iteration of the statue, she's a little more aggressive. She has her sword ready, the, statues, the shield's in her other hand, and she's wearing a new hat. So here she's wearing a wreath. Here she's wearing a liberty cap, which is what freed Roman slaves would wear. Uh, and the um, person who was in charge of ornament on the Capitol at the time, Jefferson Davis, was not OK with a representation of freedom on our nation's capital. Um, and so he insisted that the eagle, the war eagle, was hybridized with the freedom cap. 
And we ended up with this kind of strange eagle skin with stars around it on top of the Statue of Liberty's head. Um, it should be noted that the star, which has its roots in the path of Venus as seen from Earth, um, that star is representative of the goddess Venus, who was the, go the mother goddess of Rome. So in wearing these stars on her head, the Statue of Freedom is symbolically linked to her mother uh, Venus and, and thus to Rome. Um, so most people sort of think that when they see the feathers on the statue, it relates to some sort of indigenous symbolism, but really it couldn't be more Roman. Um, and the painting on the inside of the dome, right beneath the Statue of Freedom's feet, uh, makes this very explicit. She's sort of um, f um, running at or with the uh, Europeans beneath her. Uh, she was designed by Thomas Crawford in Rome and fabricated uh, by a foundry of Clark Mills. It used to be thought that Clark Mills actually performed the fabrication, but it's since been learned that Philip Reed um, did most of the work, and it was pretty complex work. Um, the statue is never more prominent than when the building is under construction. When it's not, she sort of disappears back into the sky. There have been countless memorials and monuments placed on the mall to different men throughout history. There are very few women on the mall um, with the Statue of Freedom. Here are three women at the Vietnam Women's Memorial um, who are all in different states of mourning, sitting around these sandbags. But of course, the protagonist of the statue is this fallen male soldier. The other women who are on the, depicted on the mall um, are a little funky. Um, so on the left, we have grief standing over the shoulder of history. They're both standing above victory, who's standing above infant, Neptune, and Mars. And then on the right, we see a not-so-shy nymph who is accompanying a more mature um, Neptune right at the base of the Library of Congress. Um, there's also a depiction of Venus on the Andrew Mellon fountain, which is over by the archives. That's pretty much the entirety of representation of women on the National Mall. Uh, the Statue of Freedom is pretty alone. And she's being asked to do something not unlike Prometheus, uh, it's sort of the inverse. Rather than holding the weight of the world on her shoulders, she's asked to precariously balance on top of this globe, which is on top of a dome which is on top of a building that has all of these crazy events happening. Um, and not only are there crazy events happening inside, but she's exposed to the elements on the outside as well. She can't even see a lot of what goes on, as I mentioned, um, planned and unplanned. So there are certain alignments that are just totally, um, totally uh, inaccessible to, to the Statue of Freedom. This is uh, during a repainting of the Capitol. She never knew that her, her dome had turned red. Um, inaugurations used to be held on the eastern side of the Capitol until the Reagan administration. They became too big, and so now she doesn't get to participate in those either. Uh, on the other hand, she doesn't have to participate in certain events that are less um, savory. Um, she, Trump had maybe his only kind words to, uh, about a woman. Um, about the Statue of Freedom. Atop the dome of this capital stands the Statue of Freedom. She stands tall and dignified among the monuments to our ancestors who fought and lived and died to protect her. Freedom stands tall over one more monument, this one, this capital, this living monument. This is the monument to the American people. Um, and so surprisingly, I agree with him on that point. Um, the people who would most benefit from incorporating the Statue of Freedom into their narrative also ignore her, um, and she's just ignored time and time again uh, by, by culture, by pop culture. I didn't crop this. That was how it was cropped, came across it. Um, but there are people within the federal government, within the country, who obviously understand her symbolic significance because she's represented um, in our official federal um, documents and objects over and over again. Um, here she is on a coin made in 1989 that is essentially a combination of my favorite coin and the Libertas coin, Liberty. I mean, it really couldn't be more direct. And of course, the designers by 1989 had access to be able to check out these coins. Um, 
So that's the Statue of Freedom, and I hope that when you see the Capitol, you um, remember her from now on. Across the mall from the Statue of Freedom uh, is the Washington Monument, capped by a Ben Ben. Uh, we know that an obelisk has relationship to Egypt, but it's um, a little quirkier than that. Ben Ben's were, um, obelisks were initially intended to raise Ben Ben's up into the sky, back to the gods that the Ben Ben's came from. Uh, ben Ben is um, in deepest history an oriented meteorite. So when a meteorite is falling from the sky, if it's falling in the same direction, the flames around it form it into a sort of pyramidal um, shape, and you get these um, little pyramid caps. So um, when the ancient Egyptians and others found these, um, they raised them back up into the sky where they came from, often plating them in gold when they did so. Um, they eventually started sort of making replicas out of black granite and other stones, and those are the caps of the pyramids. Um, the Egyptians, the Romans, different people throughout time have worshipped stones that have fallen from the sky, and that stone worship uh, sort of continues today. Uh, the black stone at the Kaaba in Mecca um, is purported to be the meteorite that fell to guide Adam and Eve to the location where the first temple should be built. And the Saudi government just released these high-res photos for the first time of the black stone. And you can see that it's been through so much abuse over time that it's only these little fragments um, cast within a larger um, sort of substrate. Uh, but, you know, even today people are um, recognizing the importance of these sacred stones that fall from the sky. Uh, the idea, the concept of the Ben Ben as being something that's sort of um, beyond human knowledge or um, above human knowledge um, is prominent in American iconography. Um, it's prominent in art history, even beyond the obelisk and the pyramid. Uh, our Washington Monuments Ben Ben is um, unique. It was made right before aluminum became ubiquitous. And so when it was cast, it was the largest concentration of aluminum in the world. Uh, and so rather than collecting metal that fell from the sky and raising it back up into the sky, we were producing something and sort of showing it off to the gods. This is what humanity can create. Um, and so over time, the meaning of the Ben Ben has been lost. And um, it's just sort of this thing that's up there. And people may know that the monument is capped in aluminum, but um, the, the, the sort of significance of the Ben Ben as a seat of the god is sort of lost. Um, and so the DC skyline dominated by these two figures uh, and zoning um, of DC prevents anything else from competing with these figures. So uh, there, there's a lot to work with in there. Um, and there's, I'm sure, uh, many more layers of symbolism that I haven't peeled back yet. Um, we, in order to sort of confront this issue of a classical push, um, we need to understand where these proponents of classicism are coming from. They're not only supporting classicism, they're attacking modernism and specifically brutalism. Uh, they're really doing it through a form of bullying. Um, in the public sphere. And so our way of defending these bullied buildings is to reimagine how they could exist and how they could contribute to the city. So um, we've, we were asked as part of an exhibition that is opening in Utah this month and at the National Building Museum next year um, to reconsider what the HHS building could be, which is Health and Human Services building on the National Mall right next to the Capitol. We are proposing that it become the temple of play, the largest playground in the world, accompanied by some restaurants and a daycare and a first aid center and all the amenities that are missing from the mall. Um, and to do so by building a mass timber pyramid on top and carving out the inside into a nice courtyard. Um, and so that would be uh, organized by uh, and managed by Department of Play, which would um, sort of manage playgrounds across the country. But we can't always be on the defensive, defending the buildings that we like. We also have to be on the offensive. And to do that, we need to arm ourselves with knowledge about the architecture that these classic, classical architecture proponents uh, believe in. Um, and it's not just them. The American people, when asked whether they like modern or um, classical architecture, they say, 
uh, three quarters of them say that they prefer classical architecture. These buildings are the, some of the favorite buildings of Americans. Um, and there are not very many modern buildings that are considered favorites um, of Americans when the AIA polls Americans. Uh, and so <clears throat> we'll move now into looking at some American coins, which uh, for America and for the Roman Empire, it's sort of how we've encoded how we want to be remembered uh, by deep history, knowing that coins are metal pieces that will stand the test of time and uh, be some of the, the last fragments of an empire. Uh, so the penny, our smallest unit of currency, and maybe our most um, sort of innocent uh, piece of symbolism. Um, so the Lincoln Memorial was designed by Henry Bacon. At the time that he was designing the Lincoln Memorial, he was spending time down in North Carolina building houses and churches for timber barons. And when he would go down there, he would see that the bark that was being used to tan leather um, had, you, had been used uh, for millennia by indigenous populations as architectural cladding. And so he proposed using it for that exact purpose. Um, and some of the buildings that he designed still stand today. They're in great shape. They're clad in chestnut bark. Chestnuts are gone because of the blight. So when you approach these buildings, you're approaching some of the last remaining vertical chestnut bark in the area. Um, and it's, it's pretty special. It's like visiting with the ghost. Um, and when you understand the back and forth commute that Bacon was taking during the design and construction of the Lincoln Memorial, you can start to see it in a different light, maybe in a light that the uh, Etruscans before the Romans really saw their temples, which was fields of um, trees, uh, forests. Um, and so when you see the Lincoln Memorial, maybe you see it now as a, a forest of columns. Um, the nickel, and the Monticello are uh, much more loaded topics, uh, mostly because of Thomas Jefferson, a genius who um, is not very popular these days for um, totally good reason, uh, because he did a lot of awful things in his life. Um, nevertheless, Monticello is, uh, I think, very clearly the most famous residential building in America. Uh, the White House isn't really residential. Um, so Monticello has popped up over and over again through history. <clears throat> and Jefferson, um, his political career really has overshadowed his architectural career. And so um, some architect, American architects through history have paid attention to him, but most of us um, just kind of overlook the work that he's contributed. Um, and I mentioned before he's not very popular. Um, this is a series of stamps that looks at architecture with maybe more respect than we give it these days. Uh, so it kind of goes through the, the history of American architecture by representing significant buildings. Um, and today, we have trouble doing this. And even when we think we've landed on a building that we can feel comfortable representing us, um, something happens and it comes back to bite us a little bit. So now forever on this stamp means something a little different than it did a year or two ago. Um, and, you know, these buildings whose parents have made um, terrible mistakes in their lives, uh, it, it, it's, um, if we judge the buildings based on uh, the actions of their parents, then we're really not giving the buildings the um, attention that they may deserve. So, um, and when we do that, we end up looking at somewhat generic architecture. Um, so we are going to look at Monticello. It's a very important building. Um, and Jefferson is uh, really the first American architect to bring um, ideas of space onto this continent. Uh, so the Monticello plan is pretty fussy. As Jefferson goes, he made many more um, simple, clean designs, like the design for the US Capitol. Uh, here you can see a sort of evolution of the platonic forms that Jefferson was working with, from the octagon to the square to the circle. Um, clearly influenced by Palladio, he discusses it. The White House design is the same as the Villa Rotunda. Um, but it's harder to, to understand that everyone at the time was influenced by classicism. Um, but they didn't call it classicism. They didn't call it Renaissance. Uh, what they thought they were practicing in was al antica in the ancient manner. Um, and so you can see here proposals for the White House very different, all within the Al Antica mode, 
none of them uh, Palladian, like Jefferson's designs. Jefferson was pulling from different pieces of history, influenced by history, also influencing his contemporaries. Uh, many of the um, architectural influences that came down to Jefferson were through books and through his um, elaborate library collection. These different architects who, um, during the Renaissance period, uh, made treati treaties, uh, tre treatises about uh, classical architecture, al antica architecture, each one is formulating what classicism means to them in a different way. Uh, and Jefferson did this um, to, for himself and for the North American landscape as well. We also know that he had a collection of something like 150 ancient Roman coins. So he was um, exposed to the architecture on the back of these coins. Uh, so we can uh, recognize in Jefferson's evolution a sort of transition that happens between 1772 and 1792. You see the forms becoming much simpler, much more pure, um, symmetrical in different ways. Um, in this time period, Jefferson uh, was over in Europe hanging out with influential intellectuals um, in Paris, spending time with utopian uh, French architects who we're translating some of their ideas into built architecture, uh, but we're also speculating about what space could mean and um, how space, light, and time could interrelate. And those ideas had a profound impact on Jefferson. This sketch was made in 1800, the year the Capitol was um, uh, brought into being. And you can see here a sketch of Jefferson constructing the octagon. Uh, so Jefferson went to P Paris uh, in Europe, and he comes back, and he has these ideas about pure space. And he is able to build on a totally different scale, a, a smaller residential scale, um, some of the ideas that the French utopians were thinking about. So on the left, it's a diagram looking down a, a plan uh, perspective of poplar forest. And in the center of poplar forest is a perfect 20 by 20 by 20 cube which I would argue is the first space on the North American continent. Before that, the conception of space wasn't really the same. Um, and so you can see here the, the ways that Jefferson is fulfilling some of the ambitions of Ledoux and Boulay. Um, right in the middle of the screen, the um, footprint of poplar forest plunked down on the uh, Virginia landscape. And of course, Jefferson was able to realize many more of these big utopian ideas um, on, a, on, on a much grander scale than any of the French contemporaries were able to um, enact. And um, Jefferson even brought one of them, Clarisseau, into his sort of design team for the Virginia State Capitol. Um, but the sort of power and grandeur of some of the buildings that Jefferson was able to realize influenced many generations of American architects afterwards, and as a result, we have a very uh, sort of diverse and um, sort of luscious landscape of neoclassicism. Uh, today, the advocates of these movements um, are not even really architects. And the uh, people who design in the so-called neoclassical style um, just sort of treat it as another language, one of a, a bunch of different languages that they can use. The architectural education around new classicism or neoclassicism in America is confused today. Some schools are purists, some have inner faculty uh, disagreements, and some sort of fetishize the idea of classicism. Uh, but there used to be a, a, a serious attempt to translate classical ideas into contemporary architecture and into the American uh, culture. Um, and so you can see the similarities of, of all of these buildings and the, the continuity that the architects of America's past had been attempting. Um, that 20 by 20 by 20 cube of space that Jefferson imported into Poplar Forest, uh, we can see as the base unit that Wright expands across the entire American landscape in Broadacre City, and the base unit that Kahn uses to compose different residential spaces. Um, so two different ways of using that initial 20 by 20 by 20 impetus. Um, and then we also know the Jefferson grid uh, that has overtaken the American landscape 
Um, and so these concepts that Jefferson introduced of pure space um, have really played themselves out on the American continent. Other architects in DC have attempted to deal with this balance between classicism and contemporary culture. Um, some of them, most of these are DC architects, except Daniel Burnham, who brought Union Station to DC, one of the most fantastic buildings in the city. Uh, we try to grapple with some of these ideas, um, and others have in the past as well. Uh, and you can't really um, design with American history in mind without somehow um, uh, taking a stance on Monticello. Um, so if American coins are packed with this much information, this much symbolism, Roman coins must be useful as well, uh, a people who believed much more in symbolism. Um, Roman coins can be thought of as uh, representations of architecture, as representations of conceptual ideas, uh, as postcards, as, whoops, as uh, religious um, sort of objects, um, as brands or logos, as decoration, as blogs that get information out quickly. Uh, there have been many different um, civilizations that use coins as currency. None of them use buildings on a consistent basis aside from the Romans. Even the Greeks who use coins frequently uh, primarily represented animals and people on their coins. Um, and so by focusing on the Romans, we're not ignoring other coinage systems that represent buildings and architecture. Um, this is the only group that has done that. And of course, it's the group that our founders focused on when they were uh, founding the country, making our coinage, et cetera. Um, other historians have rebuilt Roman urban fabric using representations of buildings from coins. So Calvo uh, in 1525 is putting together sort of indexing what ancient Rome was like uh, through representations on coins. And you can see a very uh, formally diverse, um, fun uh, uh, landscape that's full of personality and, and full of um, different sort of um, objects and, and, and ways of interacting with those objects. And um, you can see that diversity playing itself out in other representations of classical Rome. Uh, and so that diversity has sort of been forgotten or ignored by the proponents of classicism today. Uh, so real quick, we'll, we'll run through some Roman coins so that you can see how the Romans wanted to represent themselves to us now. You know, some of them really knew that they wouldn't be around, the Romans might not be around, but their coinage would be around and um, we would get to see it. So early on in Rome's history, we see the sort of founding myth of the she-wolf and the two brothers and the idea of shelter, the she-wolf providing shelter, and that shelter is duplicated in some of these coins with the cave that the she-wolf is within. Um, and so we, we just, as we cycle through some of these, see varying levels of abstraction, of incorporating the landscape, um, of simplifying building elements. We see a sort of postmodern super graphic pasted across the front of this temple. Um, Claudius was a historian, so insisted on gorgeous coins. Uh, here's a very formally compelling um, image. We have the port of Ostia in fisheye perspective with the colonnades running around the coin and the port itself with the ships in the middle, like just really move, moving and progressive ways of um, representing architecture. Uh, sometimes these coins were designed using text. So here we can see the form of Trajan represented very differently in three different coins, um, presumably because the, uh, the, the, the designers of the coins were just basing their designs off of textual descriptions. Um, Hadrian traveled for most of his, um, most of his rule, so uh, most of the coins that were produced during his time were um, showing off the various temples from the extent of his empire, and this is maybe my favorite. Um, from the Hadrian uh, Empire, uh, the Temple of Jerusalem representation where the building itself is dissolved away and all that's left is the sort of ornamentation and columns that are floating um, in, a, in, a, in an abstract background. Um, and so these coins, um, the, the forms of representation become more and more complex, elevation with a folded down plan, um, and makes the representation that we use in our coinage seem 
um, pretty basic, pretty simple. Um, so here are newer coins of ours that represent architecture. Um, and we have this fascination with a detailed perspective, which doesn't read on coins well at all. Um, you can see the only coin that represents modernism is here in the middle of the screen with the St. Louis Arch. Um, and <clears throat> the maybe most successful coins are um, representing uh, sort of mythological, primal, foundational, um, founding of America type narratives. And um, the architecture is basic. It's something that everyone can relate to. Um, and of course, this, this part of the narrative isn't as simple as um, we, we would like it to be or, or most Americans think that it is. Um, this is a collection of the, uh, some of the oldest houses, the oldest structures in America. All of these were built before 1713, which was the, when the Treaty of Utrecht was signed. The Treaty of Utrecht opened up the borders and the, the sort of trade between um, America and Europe and allowed for the influx of styles to take hold of American architecture. Before that, <clears throat> these first houses um, were designed and built to be durable, comfortable, safe, local, and charming. Uh, and that type of architecture, it's been around since the 1600s, waiting for us to uh, re-examine. Um, and so <clears throat> um, we are investigating these concepts because we are hoping that the proponents, the new classicists, the proponents of classicism, um, and practitioners today can um, rethink what classicism means to them. Um, and so these are a, quickly a few projects that we've tested out some of these ideas. And um, this is the grass house where we practice. It's in Anacostia. Uh, it's a lead platinum accessory structure uh, built from a bamboo framing system behind an 1892 Queen Anne Victorian house. Um, so here you see a little glimpse of the grass house. Its siding is designed to shed water as uh, efficiently over time as possible. The roof and the foundation drainage collect in a cistern that drains down into a garden. Um, and uh, the building's materials are meant to age gracefully over time. So we see some details of connections. The, the wood detailing is um, totally durable as long as there's a nice hat and boots uh, to keep the building itself um, dry. So these furring strips allow us to shed moisture that gets in behind the, um, behind the vertical siding. It also allows us to sort of express the sheer strength, the sheer forces that the bamboo, uh, uh, the bamboo framing is able to accomplish. Um, here you can see a section that um, shows you what that bamboo framing gives us, which is hollow wall cavities, continuous hollow wall cavities. That means continuous insulation within the building. Um, so a quick little diagram to describe what we're doing with BAMCOR. Um, we are able to eliminate drywall, eliminate sheathing, eliminate 80% plus of the studs inside a wall cavity, uh, and simplify the entire assembly and in doing so, give ourselves these continuous insulation cavities. Um, and that lets us uh, achieve incredibly high performance, so consistent um, heat loss uh, throughout the building, even in the corners, and very, very minimal heat uh, or, or cooling loss. Um, so some images of the interior of the grass house designed using all natural materials. Um, we sort of conceptualized that the building could burn down and we could uh, not be harmed by the fumes. Um, the stairs made from a locally felled walnut tree. There is some um, local willow, local by uh, Ohio, uh, but it's still sort of within the region. Um, woven bamboo subfloor um, and, and charred BAM core walls on the interior. We. Because we use BAMCOR, we can use minimal mechanical systems. Um, so usually we're just using mini splits with um, ERVs, energy recovery ventilators, which is what this little square is. That gives us our fresh air intake and output since the buildings are so tight, the, the thermal envelopes are so tight. 
Uh, and so this is generation one BAM core uh, built in 2019. You can see metal screws being used to attach panels. Today, we're building with generation three BAM core um, and we're nailing lap joints um, instead of screwing with metal screws. Uh, so that's Grass House. Swampy Hollow uh, is a, a tweaking of a developer spec home on Long Island. Um, we made minimal um, interventions to the front facade, just stripping away the classical columns and sort of um, replacing them with an almost Japanese uh, portal. Uh, but in the back, we added this screen porch that allowed us to represent the inverse of the grass house. So both the grass house and Swampy Hollow are um, 20 by 12 by 20 forms. The grass house is studless and Swampy Hollow is entirely studded, and it's only, um, it's only structural members except this one post are two by four studs. Um, and so here we were able to uh, test the capacity of studs on their own. Very simple structure that gives us extra space on the screen and on the porch. Ventless fireplace, a little counterintuitive, um, and views from the renovated kitchen out onto the screen porch. All of our buildings, the lighting is considered. We try to necessitate no daytime lighting, and we don't want any direct lighting um, at night or as little as possible. Um, and finally, this is uh, an alley house in DC, uh, built uh, recently, completed last year, and clad in cork and bark, wrapped in a sassafras fence, which when it rains or when the wood was cut, smells like root beer. Uh, and so the goal with this house was as much privacy as possible while also incorporating as much light as possible. And so it's essentially a light box with uh, big openings around the fenced-in, ground floor areas, uh, and then a lot of light coming in from the upper skylight. We are making use of some of our setbacks, required setbacks, to gain five-foot side yards where we have um, rain chains and drainage and mechanical unit and trash and a grill and a chair and a carport and all kinds of supplemental pieces uh, to the house. Uh, the roof is Akoya wood, so um, we were able to use wood for almost the entirety of the house. <clears throat> and let's see, we'll get inside now. Blank facades where we don't need anything. This detail is significant. We wanted to shingle the bark cladding without lapping the bark cladding in a sort of traditional way, so we stepped the underlying cork insulation um, out an inch every three feet so that the uh, bark could step over itself. And so we didn't do any tests with this, but um, it surely performs like a passive house. Uh, when you build with BAM core, you're getting almost a passive house incidentally. The door was fabricated by a friend of ours who um, attended Cooper as an architect and uh, is now a fantastic carpenter in Miami. Um, and so the house is very simple. Um, as a diagram, it's, it's a three by three grid. Uh, the center is both a stair and a large um, uh, skylight that brings light down into the middle of the home. The, Grid itself is expressed with uh, two by 12 dug for beams and poplar posts, which have checked in a way that we um, anticipated. Poplar is not conventionally used as a structural wood um, for good reason, but we wanted to sort of complete the diagram um, and use our poplar bark um, on the outside and poplar structure on the inside. The, uh, all the walls, the um, cabinetry, everything is poplar plywood. Um, and this was built during COVID, so we had um, trouble uh, sourcing conventional woods and a much easier time sourcing 
uh, more rare, unique types of woods because they were supplied by family groups, that fa family uh, companies that needed to just keep their business moving. Um, and so rather than build a space over that central atrium, and rather than leave it wide open, we've put a mesh net so that we can occupy it. The mesh net also um, catches light and brightens the space more than if it wasn't there. That's a, also a result of the fence, which acts as a sail in some light and catches the sun and brightens the interior more than it would be without. We use scrap wood to make the light baffles. <clears throat> So a lot of wood detailing feels, breathes well, the skylight's open, um, all brass. Um, every, everything that the human hand touches on the interior is brass, and everything the human hand touches on the exterior is copper. So <clears throat> in conclusion, Bildus is looking for an architecture uh, that can be appreciated by a diverse set of backgrounds, people from a di diverse set of backgrounds. So um, we want classicists and modernists and people who appreciate contemporary architecture and traditional architecture. We want uh, aesthetes and intellectuals. We want architects and non-architects um, to be able to get into um, what we design and to be able to appreciate what we design um, Rem said that architecture is dead today. Um, and unfortunately, we kind of agree with him. So we're doing our best to try to resurrect the spirit of American architecture. Um, now that I've shown you all this, I hope that you guys can um, see the space between the stars like I do. Thanks. Any questions? I think the people who designed her were very confused people. I mean, these were people who were defending slavery, so it's hard to get into their mindset. I wish I had a better answer for you. I wish that some of them weren't a part of our history, but they are. Yeah. Yeah, so Jefferson, like Broadacre City, Jefferson conceptualized the American landscape as being um, subdivided by a grid that could allow us to have some control over um, the different programs that we knew would exist. So now when you fly over the country and you look down and you see all the farmland divided into its different um, um, fragments, those fragments are this north-south grid that um, was initially conceptualized by Jefferson during the time that he was conceptualizing our perfect 10 by 10 capital square. So the idea of the origin, the capital as the origin point or the Washington Monument as the origin point, the idea of DC, the idea of the perfect square of uh, poplar forest, the Jeffersonian grid, um, these are all seen as components of American history, but not really as a framework of an introduction of conceptual space to America. And I think the Jeffersonian grid is the sort of largest, um, that is that concept being carried out at, at its largest scale. Yeah. Yeah.
I think it's always worthwhile to engage. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't gotten into it. Um, one of your classmates did in the past and had a great concept. Um, I think it would be disappointing if we all just gave up and said, let's submit to the Statue of Freedom. <laughs> else? Thank you.